Right, so this is just a quick note on the difference between the competitive labour market and the monopsony labour market. Now, this is a really useful distinction and analytical tool for looking at a lot of different issues in labour market economics that are on the syllabus. For example, the national minimum wage, uh, trade unions, you can uh, look at through this lens as well. So a reminder, first of all, of the, the assumptions of a perfectly competitive labour market. So we're assuming many buyers of labour. So there's no monopsony situation. There's lots and lots of different employers in the industry. There are also many, many sellers of labour and those sellers are not organised under any trade union or anything like that. So we've got individual bargaining between lots and lots of different workers and lots and lots of different employers, different buyers of labour. Number three is perfect information. So uh, there's freedom of information around the labour market. Uh, all the buyers uh, and sellers know of each other's existence. There are no costs of negotiating labour contracts in this case. There's also, which is not on here actually, a perfect mobility of workers. So workers can move sort of costlessly and easily between different jobs. There is no geographical or occupational immobility of labour in the model. And finally, workers are homogenous, they are identical. So uh, in terms of training, in terms of productivity, uh, in a given, in a particular occupation, uh, workers are identical. That's not to say that productivity is identical across all industries, it's just saying that each worker in a particular industry is identical. So a, a builder is a builder, for example, in this model. So. This is the perfectly competitive labour market from the point of view of the individual firm. So this is hopefully revision. And we've got a U-shaped MRP curve there, which is the demand for labour. So a reminder that the MRP, the marginal revenue product, is the marginal physical product multiplied by the price of the good or service that the business is producing and selling. So MRP equals MPP times price. And because the marginal product curve, the marginal physical product curve is U-shaped, then the marginal revenue product curve is U-shaped. Now, the reason why the marginal physical product curve is U-shaped is due to something called the law of diminishing returns. The law of diminishing returns. You should be familiar with this from back when we did supply theory. This is the theory that says that as we add more and more workers to a fixed amount of labour and capital, then productivity of workers originally rises and then falls. So the extra output produced by each extra worker rises initially and then falls. We played a game where you were making boxes and we gradually added each worker to a fixed amount of classroom space and a fixed number of things like uh, staples and hole punches uh, to make the uh, or equipment to make the boxes. So as you add more and more workers, each extra worker initially produces more boxes, but then eventually each worker produces fewer boxes. Too many cooks spoil the broth. You get workers getting in each other's way and that kind of thing. Uh, workers are queuing to use capital equipment. So it's U-shaped. The MPP curve is U-shaped. And if so therefore, if MRP is MPP times price and MPP is U-shaped, then MRP will also be U-shaped as long as the price is constant. MRP is MPP times price. If price is constant, then MRP is also U-shaped in that situation. Now, the uh, supply curve for the individual firm is horizontal. The firm is a wage taker. The firm has no influence over the wage rate that it pays its workers. And to understand this, you now need to watch the Lego video, which will explain why the labour supply curve is horizontal. And it will also explain why the labour supply curve is upward sloping in the monopsony case, which we will look at shortly. So you need to pause this video now and watch the Lego video, and then you will be able to move forward with this video. So you've had a look now at the Lego video, um, explaining the difference between the individual firm in the competitive case and the individual uh, firm in the monopsony case. Uh, in a competitive market, the overall market can be explained using the simple demand and supply model that you are familiar with already. So downward sloping labour demand, that's demand for labour in the whole market, upward sloping labour and hopefully that's pretty straightforward. <clears throat> now. In the monopsony case, uh, the firm is the market because there's only one buyer of labour. And 
we have seen that the labor supply curve is upward sloping for the monopsonist. But in order to fully understand the monopsony model, we need to derive the marginal cost curve for the monopsonist as well. So we've seen from the Lego video that the wage rate paid to the workers, uh, the supply curve for labor, is upward sloping. So if we employ zero workers, then clearly our wage cost is going to be zero. <clears throat> if we employ one worker, we're going to say that that's going to uh, pay, we're going to pay that worker £10 an hour. If we employ two workers, then the extra cost of employing the second worker has gone up. So we're going to pay each, uh, each, each worker £20 per hour. If we employ three workers, we're going to pay each worker £30 per hour. It's important to understand that we pay each worker the same. If we're employing more and more builders on a building site, we're not going to pay our third builder more money than we paid our second builder or our first builder. Because remember, workers are homogenous, and so we have to pay each worker the same. So the table here shows the average cost, the cost of production, the wage cost for each worker. How do we derive, therefore, the marginal cost for the monopsonist? Well, the marginal cost is the change in total cost divided by the change in the number of workers employed. So if we take one worker and the average cost is £10 an hour, then the total cost must be £10 an hour. So the marginal cost, which is the change in total cost, must also be £10 uh, ten pounds for one worker employed. Now, if two workers are employed and the average cost is twenty pounds, the total cost must be forty pounds. Twenty multiplied by two is forty pounds. Average cost is total cost divided by output, so total cost must be average cost times um, quantity of labour, not output. I apologise. Quantity of labour in this case because we're dealing with labour market. So average cost times quantity of labour employed. In this case, so if the total cost is forty pounds of employing the sec uh, of employing two workers, then the marginal cost, which is the change in total cost, must be thirty pounds. Hopefully, we understand that. For three workers, if the average cost is thirty pounds, the total cost must be average cost times employment, which is thirty pounds times three, which is ninety pounds, and the difference between total cost of £90 and the total cost at two workers, which is £40, must be £50. So in case you're wondering where that comes from, the £50 in row three there, the £50 is the difference between 30 times 3 and 20 times 2. Similarly, the £30 in the uh, row of the table, which has two workers employed, that marginal cost of £30 is the difference between 20 times 2 and 10 times 1. So the marginal cost for labour is upward sloping. And notice that the marginal cost is rising at twice the rate of the average cost. The average cost is going up in tens. The marginal cost is going up in twenties. That is a rule that you can apply. The marginal cost will go up at twice the rate of the average cost. So to get our monopsony diagram, we have to do the following. Now, we here we have the same assumptions as for perfect competition, except we drop the assumption of many buyers. There is now only one buyer and many sellers of labor. So one buyer, many sellers, perfect information, perfect mobility, etc. Now, in a perfectly competitive market, the wage rate will be determined at W star Q star, which is where the demand for labor meets the supply of labor, which we saw from the previous table, is the average cost of employing labor. Now, the monopsony has wage setting power, which the competitive market didn't have. So how many workers does the profit maximizing monopsonist decide to employ? Well, it's marginal analysis yet again. So remember, the marginal cost curve is twice the slope of the average cost curve. So we now put it on our marginal cost curve there. How many workers does the monopsonist decide to employ? The answer is the number of workers which maximizes the welfare of the monopsonist, of the single employer. So the monopsonist is going to employ the, exactly the number of workers where the extra cost of employing those workers, which is the marginal cost, equals the extra benefit of employing those workers, which is the marginal revenue product, the extra revenue 
that the business will get from employing those workers. So it's marginal analysis yet again. The number of workers employed by the monopsonist will be where the marginal cost equals the marginal revenue product. And that is where MC cuts D at Q1 in this case. So the number of workers employed is Q1. Notice that the monopsonist employs fewer workers than in the perfectly competitive case. So employment will fall in the case of a monopsonist, in the case of a single buyer of labour. If you want an example of a monopsonist, incidentally, um, a, the National Health Service is pretty much the only employer of uh, doctors and nurses in the UK. Yes, of course, we do have private healthcare companies, but the NHS is has by far and away the biggest uh, share of the market there in terms of buyers of labour in the health sector. Um, Tunbridge School is the biggest employer in Tunbridge, you may or may not be aware. So it has some degree of monopsony power in the labour market in Tunbridge. So anyway, the monopsonist employs Q1 workers. What is the wage rate that the monopsonist pays? I'll give you just a few seconds to think about that. So pause the video and think about what wage rate does the monopsonist pay. Remember, the monopsonist is employing Q1 workers. What wage rate does it pay? So hopefully you've got an answer there, and you've pretty much got a 50-50 because there are two other points apart from the W star where the two curves cross. The answer is W1. Well done if you got that right. The answer is W1. Now, why does the monopsonist only pay W1? Remember, the monopsonist is a single employer. So just as a monopolist, a monopolist can drive the price of what it sells uh, as high as that permitted by the demand curve, a monopsonist can use its power to drive the wage rate down as far as it possibly can do. Not as low as, as, low as, um, as, low as it would like necessarily, but as low as possible. So if it decides to employ Q1 workers, it will drive the wage rate down to the minimum wage that workers will be prepared to work at, which is W1. That's the just the rate at which workers are compensated for not taking an hour of leisure and taking an hour of work. All right. So the monopsonist drives the wage rate down. So the way to think of it is the monopsonist firstly decides how many workers is it going to employ. It employs the profit maximizing number of workers, which in this case is Q1, not Q star, because MC equals MRP, which is D. And then it drives the wage rate down as low as it possibly can do, just to the point where workers would decide enough's enough and they're not going to bother working at W1. So the monopsony equilibrium is W1Q1. The key conclusion then of this lesson is that in a monopsony the wage rate is lower and the quantity of workers employed is lower than would be the case under perfect competition if there is only one employer then the monopsonist will use its power to drive the wage rate down and drive down the quantity of employee uh, of employment as well notice that we also get a deadweight loss of economic welfare with a monopsonist because there is an extra revenue product and an extra uh, cost of labor. So uh, if we employed Q1 to Q star workers, then the extra revenue product <clears throat> is greater than the uh, cost of hiring workers there. So there is a, a deadweight loss of economic welfare in the labor market. So there's your key points. In a perfectly competitive market, employers are wage takers. In a monopsony, the employer has wage setting power and can drive down the wage rate. Okay, hopefully you got something out of that and we will see you for the next labor market video.